good morning, everybody. Good morning, Sunday in Vegas. Is, uh, it's actually pretty special to see this many people here on a Sunday morning and uh, not having too many hangovers or whatever the case is, so I appreciate you coming. I'm Dave Franco. I'm with Sodexo. And for Tim Ream, I'm also with Sodexo. Thanks again for coming. Um, just, it's just to get a kind of sense. Can we get a kind of, so who's in in-house? Uh, ISO. OEM. Nice. You guys good admit mix. It. You admit it. I like it. Yes, they were pretty way to admit it. That's good. That's good. Thank you all for being here. Um, really, it, I, as I start out every conversation, I like to think about two perspectives. One, I pray that you guys take something away because I hate to waste your time. And two is, uh, I, um, honestly, it's just understand this is kind of like Tim's mind or my particular perspective, and so it's not always right. And part of the issue is we really hope that you guys are going to be participatory and give us some feedback and input so that we all do better. Because at the end of the day, I think that's why you're here, aside from the party, aside from the gamble and the drink, and hopefully we're here to gain more knowledge and some uh, experience. So we're going to talk, we'll go through it and talk about it. And uh, let's start out with, um, first of all, Tim. No. Um, I think that's the nail on the head. And I hope everybody like you, like Todd, is in Vegas, part of the thing. You know, while we're here, they have a little bit of fun, take the gamble. Vegas Point, we have a lot of vertical people this morning, and I think that's wonderful. Especially on a Sunday morning. So, anybody have any uh, preconceived notions? Anybody came in here for specific reasons? Something they wanted to make sure that we talked about or covered? All right, well, again, please, all throughout the process, I can assure you I will ask questions and elicit participation. And I would ask you guys to share with each other some thoughts and things that you guys have done. So let's walk through it. All right, so the first one, sorry, I didn't realize it was going to look so small up there, right? Um, this, what this slide is supposed to represent in particular is, I'm assuming you're all here because of what the title is, is how do I take it in-house? So the question becomes, why are you doing that? And I will tell you that I think it's imperative, good morning, Mr. Chris, how are you today, buddy? Um, I think it's imperative that you know what that is, because I will tell you there's a few slides here that as we go through this process that are absolutely going to be paramount. As you become to the forks in the road, which you will come to many forks in the road, they will help you guide you and figure out what's the best next step. And as you come to bumps in the road, it'll help guide and direct you. So it's extremely important that you understand what it is as your motivator as to why you're doing this. So we're going to kind of walk through those and Tim and I will give some examples around things that we're aware of that might be your motivators and that will have play part and parcel on helping you decide and how you're going to put your presentation in the process. And hopefully your proposal together to get pulled from the administration. So like the first one is not a hard thing, right? Increase job security. Add value to the position that you're in, the organization, the department that you have. Could be the motivator itself. It's certainly acceptable and reasonable, rational reason to have that. The next one might be financial savings to the hospital. That's always another motivator, big one, right? The hospital's asking you to bring more value to your department. And please chime in with any point. Um, I tell you, one of the biggest ones that has helped me and I have done in the past, in addition to the other two, is I'll give you an example. Uh, Bay State Health Systems back in uh, 1990, uh, we had had 36 technicians. We were responsible for three hospitals. We had every piece of energy. But we had gotten to the point where everybody had been maxed out on their opportunity for new training, new opportunities, new exposure, new equipment. So what I do is I actually started a for-profit division within our system then we went out and offered services to five other local hospitals. What that did is, in addition to literally bringing $5 million to our hospital and growing our program, as well as it was pretty profitable because I mean, resources were already covered and paid for, the real value was our employees were ecstatic because they got to go to learn something new, new equipment that they didn't already have in our program. It was a huge motivator. So, I mean, that may be what drives you. And I would say they don't have to be just one. It could be a combination of all three. and. You may be trying to increase value, job security. If you're already about an ISO or an OEM coming in and taking over the unit. You know, financial, I think everybody, for the most part in this business, is pretty interested in trying to save hospitals money. It doesn't matter if you're with an OEM, in-house, ISO. Uh, you know, financial burdens really in healthcare today are paramount. Everybody's struggling. Even your best hospital systems with your best track records, they're trying to find ways to save money. And they're doing it for many different ways. Some of them are looking to expand programs and opportunities in other areas, such as home health, 
some of the times they may be looking to do um, you know, post-market treatment or wellness programs. These are things that are typically don't have tons of funding within a hospital system, typically don't have decent profitability, and aren't going to have paybacks. So they have to find the money from somewhere. Um, one of the key levers I often talk about when we're talking financial and savings in particular is it's a pretty easy way to look at it when you're talking about the money you save and converting into potential revenue that a hospital stream could provide. And the way I always look at that, uh, my kind of benchmark and from my in-house experiences uh, has always been a 5%. Typically, if a hospital is generating about a 5% profit margin, they're doing extremely well. They're doing what I consider thriving. Anything less, you get down to 3%, 2%, they're surviving. They're in survival. And so even at a 5% margin, if you save a million dollars across your entire clinical engineering budget, that's actually got a 20 to 1 ratio. That's the equivalent of a hospital driving $20 million in new business. Let's say opening or expanding an ortho program. And when that $20 million worth of revenue they've generated, how much do they earn at the end of the day at 5%? Anybody good at math? A million dollars, that's what you just saved. So every time you save a million bucks, it's worth about 20 million in revenue for a healthcare system. And that's assuming they actually did 100%, right? Because most of the time, Medicaid and Medicare, they didn't get in. And it depends on service lines. Some of them are just straight loss leaders and things like that. But I mean, you could literally use 5% as a rule of thumb. So if you could save a million bucks, it's the same as the hospital going out and selling 20 million in new services. How many people are seeing base business in their hospital expanding by 20 million a year. Are reimbursements going up or are they going down? They're going down. They're going down. So hospitals are always trying to fight that revenue stream because, like I said, 5%, that's not Every dollar they get, 95% of it goes away before they even have money to reinvest or do anything in the healthcare system. So that 5% is, is net profit? That's after your bad debt, charitable cares, <clears throat> things like that, which is only increasing. Quite frankly, look at that debt, charitable care, and most uh, nonprofit organizations. That continues to rise. Why? Because we're making changes to programs like in Arizona, the Access Health Program. We eliminated about 380,000 single participants several years ago. Do we think those 380,000 people don't go to the hospital anymore? They still get sick, just like you and I. That's what we call bad debt or charitable care. Some organizations have extremely high volumes of that. The healthcare system I was part of, we actually had one year where we had almost 25% of our revenue was out the door before we even started doing business in bad debt and charitable care. And that is an $8 billion health system that was had 25% of its revenue stream. Well, the difference between the Correct. So it's the consumers paying more, but there's less of the government and all the other considerations. So, so here's a quick, quick question. Now, this is kind of an option. Right? Tim decided to think about this. It wasn't really supposed to be part of the presentation. But so, on average, does anybody have an idea as to how much a CT is reimbursed for? Just rough figures. Sorry. Yeah. So it used to be thousands of dollars, right? I mean, it was be it could be anywhere. I mean, I can remember back when they first came out, it was ten thousand, fifteen thousand dollars, and it kept going down. Yes. Well, now it's 600 bucks. Mm -hmm. So the reality of it is, is you know, start just stop and think about this for a second, right? So the CT tubes haven't been bought a whole lot. I mean, they have, but not tremendously, right? I mean, you can still pay $150,000, $175,000 for a tube. But where you used to get a couple thousand, five or $6,000 for a scan, now you're getting 600. You got to do a hell of a lot more scans to replace $150,000 tube. And how many of those are free, too? Right. That end up turning bad debt, care of care. So it's 600, and then it's less everything else. Anybody in the hospital side have problems with uh, observation stays 
we're seeing an increase in rises in the observation uh, population. 2359. Yep. Mental health. Have we seen increases and in rises in admittance around there? How much did mental health get reimbursed at? Anybody know? <laughs> Absolutely. Mental health and observation stays get about 10% of the reimbursement that actually an inpatient stay gets. Do they require that much less assistance and treatment? And do they have nurses that still take care of them? You still have all those fixed expenses. You still have the building. You still have all the overhead. Except for you get so much less. That's why the value piece and the financial piece is so critical. Like I said, you can save a million dollars. Boy, that offsets a ton of those other negative impacts. Because the healthcare system still have to treat you. And that's what we all want, is the patients to be treated. It's not about the money, but they still have to be able to afford to keep the doors open. Well, that's what the bullets are on total cost of ownership, right? You guys understand that term. It's, you know, what's the cost of installing? What kind of facilities changes have to be done? The room itself, or air handling, or the humidity, or all that stuff is all part of the cost. When they tell you they're going to sell you this thing for a million dollars, most of the time, procurement and others aren't involved in all the other aspects that have to go with it. So that's a piece that you guys can bring the value at. It's imperative that you understand that. And when you look at the total life cycle of the cost of that thing, that's what's important. And you can manage that and be able to talk about it. I think this issue is valuable. Would you consider describing really into a foundation? Chris, and the sad truth of the matter is, and we're going to try to do this in about an hour, but this is a career. <laughs> I mean, people make careers out of this conversation that we're having. So, yes. I, you know, another observation I had here recently was that, uh, uh, you know, when GE or Sodexo or somebody comes through the door and they're going to, and they're, they're going to say they're going to save the hospital a million dollars or, or whatnot, in our imaging department, we're going to cut a million off of your, uh, your, your expenses. The thing about it is, like GE is uh, is uh, they're taking uh, they're taking a little money over here in Albuquerque, a little money over here in Oklahoma City to hire an al uh, uh, analyst and to work crunch the big data uh, to to be able to uh, put that data forward. Whereas I, you're it, yeah. And so it's very hard for me to to walk in and say, well, this is what I'm going to say, but what I what I can do uh, is show them my track history, what I have done, and um, and yeah. that you can't undersell because, as I often say, and this is really around trying to bring in services in now. This is not for us to sell you an exo service or anything like that. It's trying to give you ideas. You know, I think myself and Dave, we work for every facet of this business possible. And it's really to try to break down some of those things. So really that buy-in and support piece. But you can't say enough about proven past performance and your track record. It's something we probably don't do to Chris's you know, uh, thoughts back there. You don't do well enough. Because if I have two you know, processes and you came to me and you said, here's what I've done in the past. Show me a great track record over several years. Here's what I want to do in the future. And then I have a conversation with a GE or a Sodexo comes in. Tim's trying to pitch to your administrator why they should use Sodexo and I'm going to save them all this money. If you've already set that stage, you're that much far off that. Because all I can say is what I'm going to do for you moving forward in the future. I can tell you about other places I've done it. But what I can't say is here's what I've done the last several years that has made this possible. I can't paint them that picture. It's all about future. Are you buying the future? Or you buying what you already have and you know works and did itself. And so one of the pieces up here we'll talk about pretty extensively, I think, on the next slide, is really around the way to sell to each of those people within the hospital system and what is their buying influence. Why is that important to them and how are you going to pitch that sale? Because as I often tell people, you know why it's so easy for the OEMs and ISOs and people like me to come in and tell them that I'm going to save you a million dollars? 
I got salespeople. I got data. I got all that stuff. You've got to be as equally a good as salesman and your own ter internal department. And I'll talk about some specific examples of about 10 years ago when I first got to Banner Company and really how I set that stage and how we grew from a department that had about 14 imaging engineers to 64 imaging engineers covering every single modality, including cyclotrons, linear accelerators, you name it. There wasn't a single piece we didn't cover. And it was all by building and setting that stage and using those examples, using those wins of things that they've done years before. I even walked in the door and saying, here's what your people really can do. Because at the end of the day, for the most part, most biomeds I meet and imaging engineers are really good at doing what they're doing. If you just give them the tools, the resources they need, they're going to be successful. Right after it goes out to RFP or it goes and they bring somebody in, and you're absolutely right. And I think, how many of you guys have been involved in a consulting gig with Deloitte coming in, whether it's through IT or through administration? Anybody in here been involved in those processes? <laughs> Boy, if you haven't, I tell you, if you haven't, bless the Lord above, because there is nothing more painful in the universe than that process. To Marianne's point, I've been through it numerous times, especially at a large health system. You can imagine people like Deloitte have connections and people that you probably would not even run into in a health system, whether they're a chairman of the board or the CEO or people that they've been friends with or they've known. And then to Marianne's point, if you're paying several million dollars a year for this luxury of having it, it's incumbent on them to provide you something. And, and tell you where you can see, even if it's wrong, even if they don't understand the business, and it's very difficult to combat if you don't already have that stage stage set, and you don't know what their responses are going to be, because you have to be very proactive in that process, because they come up with some oddball stuff that they throw out there as far as the metrics. They don't understand all the levers, as I used to, you know, say when the consultant would come in, explain to me what happens when I do this. I said, so if I decrease my labor, and let's say I lay off 30 people in a healthcare system, what does that do to everything else? Well, they don't care. They don't understand that now my outside service costs go up. They don't understand that now it's going to cost me more in parts because I don't have my own people doing the work. I've got to take whatever I get from an OEM or whoever comes in and gives me the part. I'm not likely to shop it. They don't, they don't make that correlation. What they say is, you have X number of people, if you cut 30 of them, this represents $3 million. Now go away. So that whole power inside, right? From an administrator's perspective, that might get shifted from his silo or her silo to somebody else's silo. So they're good. Right? Yes. So from, to an administrator, they're good. Yeah. But one point that they use the word, you said career. And probably 
probably as close to this in this group or many of you as a leader. Uh, but even as a practitioner, you should be a leader as well. You know what, Ken? Don't be so nice. I know you want to relax and you want to turn the blue cube on and watch the TV. Maybe I'll put a laptop or a piece of paper. Think of it think of for an hour. Just think about what you did that day and document it. And, you know, you say here, you take it for granted. Because we're biomed, right? We save money. Your administrator, administrators today, they don't know that today. You know, they're not in the trench anymore because there's so much crap happening at the administrative level. There's so much hitting them administratively. We have to be the purveyor of the data that they use, and their data for it, and all those administrators are data for it. They've got to have it to start to release it. CEO comes in there, they better have it without digging too much. When you look at, in Chris's point, and I think it's one of those ones coming diffi more difficult on the administration side because they're also paring down. Now you see a lot of support services, VPs, or people that now have clinical departments reporting up through them and all sorts of strange things that wouldn't have happened 10 years ago. Are we a priority? The only time I see biomed typically on that list of a priority is if something really bad and it's really broken. Otherwise, you're probably not on their top 20 list of things that they've got to face, whether it's physician engagement and, and trying to have positive relationships with them, whether it's having the community outreach and having relationships with the mayor, whoever else they need to interact with. Their life's gotten very complex and they have all sorts of readmission penalties, things like that. They have a list of about 20 things that come before even the thought of, hey, I wonder how things in biomed are. I mean, it's just not going to raise to that level. And so you have to be proactive. Years in the past, you know, I would say it's one of the reasons why we get stuck in the basement. Because most people don't even know we're there. Stuff just naturally works. And if you run a good biomed program, that's how it appears. There's no pain. If there's no pain, people don't focus on it. Healthcare is all about fixing pain, right? I mean, that's kind of the whole premise of why hospitals healthcare exists. If there's no pain. There's no attention. So it's one of those ones you got to be much more proactive nowadays. You can't just be the people in the basement and hopefully people are going to defend you, support you, and understand every piece of your business and what you do. you got to educate them all along the way. Because we do some amazing stuff in this career field. Every time you get on that radar, dealing with especially in cybersecurity, yep. that, that'll be a big one. Uh, you know, some kind of a I think Marianne can attest is the other thing is, is you just need to make your mind up this. Somebody gets off a plane or drives in in a fancy car and has a consultant hat on, what they have to say gets a lot more weight than you do. So you're going to have to figure out a way to counterbalance that. And in some instances, I've seen with my med department has actually gone out and gotten their own consultant to counterbalance the hospital consultant. So just throwing that out there for you to consider to start you know, putting your pieces together. As we, as we move on, um, so the, the biggest thing around this in my mind is it's not, this is very, very difficult. You can't flip a switch tomorrow and say, you know what, I think I'm going to take care of radiology. That's not going to happen. In most cases, first of all, you got, it's the largest revenue generating. It's got the most political capital. It's got a lot of things that are going against it. So if you're not in favor, if it's not something that somebody sees as a problem today, they're not going to want you to fix it. So it takes a long time to prepare. I, I'm saying a minimum of 24 months. It could take longer. But you got to start with what pieces of equipment do I have? How are they being covered today? Um, you know, how are they getting from a PM and a, and a uh, corrective maintenance? Does a department like the process that they have today? Is, it, is, there, is there a loophole? There's something that they're not thrilled about that I can start attacking and use that as some of the impetus to get them out of the mindset. So, And to Dave's point, that's a great kind of thought. When you're looking at this piece up here, is this is all stuff you're doing in advance. This is stuff you're doing while somebody else is taking care of that equipment. You're building that stage with actual data and information. 
And so when you're going in there and talking to the radiology director and you're saying, okay, what are the hours of coverage? Who's servicing it? Is there any problems? Have you had any issues? Oh, well, they come in all the time and I get these bills and you're building your case piece by piece by piece. Yeah. And this all involves just basically interviewing and talking to the department. Well, but one step further, I think, to Tim's point, is even if you don't have the responsibility for it and it is an outsourced right. contract, you need to be involved with the servicing apps. Okay. Right? So whether it's GE or Phillips or Siemens, I don't care who it is, even if it's a third party thing. As the in-house biometric program, even if you don't have responsibility for that device, get involved with the service history because that's going to give you the most insight as to what's working and what's not working. So that's the value of that. I encourage all the biometrics to be involved in the service. Absolutely. When you can. Make sure that you're doing the contract and that you have the And a declining value. I mean, contracts decrease in value every single day. You may look at it today and decide a 30% discount is wonderful. Five years from now, to your point, after that thing renews a couple times, and now you're still paying, you know, $100,000 for that contract at that 30% discount when some rural hospital in the middle of nowhere is paying 75 or 80 for the same contract. Matter of fact, no contract should ever be signed by Frank and my eyes without the biomed director signing on the first. And you should get you should get that training. You should get training by the middle of that contract. You know how that is work. Absolutely. And some of the times what you'll face, and I don't remember if we've had it in the presentation, so I will just kind of key off that one for a minute. With the training piece, since the manufacturers do have to line item that out on the purchase orders now. One of the pushbacks that I see a lot of places having is what's supply chain. And they say, well, we don't want to include that. That raises the cost of it. One I've always advocated when I've heard that is I've said, great, just charge it to my department. Because the cost is always going to be pretty low because they don't want to jack up that training cost for you because it's going to make them look unfavorable in the equipment purchasing part. So if you get training in there, it's going to be at a much lower rate, even if you have to transfer funny money between yourself and supply chain. Got paid for. Don't just accept, well, we don't want to put it in there because it raises the price. Say, fine, I'll pay it. Hit me with the expense we still want. Now, you say in house parts, right? Certainly, I mean, in the house parts. The way I look at our contracts, too, is that we're signing from both of them either shared agreement or something. I look at, especially with some of our OEM partners, who have come to us and said, Nobody except for your staff will work on the team. I say no, that's right. But it is a fluid environment. I may hire a guy. One guy on my team may be hired through maybe steps. That's not on my radar right now. But it has to be something that I don't want to be prohibited from doing. Just because the manufacturers are going to bring me into and the devil's in the details on those. And I will tell you, everything's open for negotiation. I mean, when it comes down to the sale of a piece of equipment, everything's open for negotiation. How many people in here believe that you can write you know, contracts with the big four that have 30-day cancellation notice, no penalties? I've done it repeatedly, time and time and time again. And yet, they'll say it's impossible. We absolutely never do that. I said, do you know that I've worked for other institutions where we've done exactly yep. the same thing? But they did it because right. I'm in a new market. Right. And the guy didn't know. I called him out on it. Right. Right. And healthcare is changing. And quite frankly, I will tell you, the OEMs are changing. They're becoming much more flexible with this stuff. They're becoming much more uh, you know, creative around their solutions as well and saying, you know what? Maybe we should do it a little different. Maybe we can, you know, help you with X, Y, and Z. As I've always often said, there's a value for everything. Let's put a cost to it. If I want diagnostic software keys, I'm willing to pay for it as that end user. I know the value of it for my technicians. I know the value of it for the turnaround time and the quick fix of the equipment. There's a value. Have that discussion. Put a price on it. 
You want clinical application support. That used to be something that every you know radiology director and people used to get bent out of shape. You're going to cancel our contract. We don't get clinical app support no more. Is there a value to it? Would you pay for that value? What is the cost? Is it two grand a year, five grand a year? What you know? Put a value to it. Have that discussion with you know your RSM or even an ISO. Tell them which things you value and what you would like that package to look like. And then really work with them to put, like I said, a price around it, package it, and then it's something that you want. Because it should be very individualistic. It should be very fluid because my response to everybody in that case, especially with cancellation clauses, things like that, healthcare is not going to stop changing. And I may have a distinct need today, and my hospital may do something wildly outrageous, and tomorrow I have, let's say, full service contracts on five CTs that now all of a sudden we're going to shift all of our outpatient radiology to, you know, we have Simon Med. That might be what the hospital has to do. Why would I have to continue that contract and pay for it? Because equipment's not been deinstalled. We're still kind of locked in from that angle. Shouldn't that be a fluid process to say, you know what? Our models changed in the healthcare system. Now I need something different. Let's work on what that is. Maybe it's a much different solution. Good cop, bad cop. We got to be good cop, bad cop. Well, and it, it, to your point, Chris, and this is what Tim and I will do this slide potentially could, could take a whole day. Um, you know, we sit here and on a regular basis and we start talking about sales, and, and that's what you're doing here sales. Right now, you're in sales mode because you've got to go win over each and every one of these people. And the reality of it is, is that their motivator is going to be different in every case. The CEO of the hospital wanting to get involved and help you be successful is going to be a whole lot different than the clinical staff or the department head or the physicist. So, again, I mean, we can talk about it, but every one of these things. And one of the challenges I've done in, in my career, and I do this on a pretty regular basis with the staff, is I'll take a, uh, let's say, a graph. Right. Let's call it a safety graph, or a PM completion graph in the EOC. And I'll ask my staff, to see, if I'm trying to help somebody grow, become more of a leader, I'll ask them to describe that graph, the same graph, to the CEO, to risk management, to nursing, to the head of the EOC, pretend as a joint commission inspector. That's the exact same graph. And let me tell you, your presentation is going to be different in every case. If you're trying to take over radiology, you want to take over the head of the ability take over the department and have responsibility for maintaining the equipment, you're going to have to win over every one of these people because just like, just to give you a little insight, just like when Sodexo comes to your house and wants to knock on your door and come in, not very often do we get invited in by the biomed, but in almost every case that biomed can keep our asses out of it. So it's the same thing here. And I would say when you look at these, you can take any kind of buckets and to the data point, you have great conversations around buying influence, what's important to these people, but even take something as simple as radiology and go into the radiology director of that hospital. They're going to have some concerns. How can you win them over? The one that I often see, and generally doesn't lead to the greatest results, is we'll put a great plan together and we're pretty good at data and analytics in this career field because we're all kind of engineers and that's what we like. And so we'll put a plan together and it's going to say, I'm going to say a million dollars, da 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 and, and we're going to throw it up there. We're going to probably do it during some multidisciplinary meeting. We're probably going to have maybe the associate VP in it. We're probably going to have the radiology director, maybe somebody from finance, things like that. And it's going to be the first time those people see that. You've lost. It's over. Go back. You're not going to win that one. And why I say that is one of the most key parts is what I call having supporters. You want to win over radiology. What's a great way to do it? Maybe you might not have the personal connection and the most wonderful relationship with the radiology director. But maybe you have a great relationship with the CT supervisor, the ED tech, 
whoever it might be that has some influence with that person. You pitch the idea to them, it's almost like having a plan. Then you invite the radiology director, you invite their supervisors through all the different departments. You already have two or three people that you've already discussed this with in advance. You've already told them the value. You already got their buy-in. They're kind of the supporter. And so when everybody else starts going, ooh, I don't know, they go, no, this, this is probably pretty good. And you pick the key ones that have that influence. Maybe they've been there 20 years. Everybody else looks at them. You know, the CT supervisor is kind of being that person that knows everything. You know, That's a wonderful way to set the stage. Get that plan, get that influencer before you go present. And then after you went over one of those, let's say you go to finance, you do the same thing. You get a couple finance people that are pretty excited. They understand the concept. You've really broken it down. You've asked for their input. <clears throat> Love that. Well, does this look right? Does this kind of flow? Well, maybe we should make some changes here because financially, you know, this would look better if you did X, Y, and Z. Let them help you prepare those documents. It goes a long way. And I tell you, when you have several of those people now, you got the maybe CFO, you got the radiology director, now you're bringing in administration, the physicist, medical director, whoever can even be involved in that conversation. You've already got support for the concept. That's a pretty easy sell. All it took was probably three or four additional meetings. The outcome will be drastically different. I mean, drastically different when you pre-sell. And that's what we call a lot of times, especially in the OEM and the actual world, you have to pre-sell something. You don't just go in and make a proposal and tell them you're going to save a million dollars. That's probably not going to be a door open. You have pre-sell. You got to get support. You got to build momentum. That's how you work through these processes and really set the stage for what you want to sell at the end of the day. Real value to me is if you can get through the process of understanding what the assessment is probably making you better. Their most important thing is, am I making my... Uh, radiology chair happy, right? Because as long as you're keeping him happy, then that keeps his noise level down, right? And am I getting my finance guy on board? So I've done some research, and that's making me stronger. I get into the med, um, I get into physicists, right? And so now I'm ensuring that it's going to be as good or even better because he's got one joke. So I'm locally on the side. And if you've worked with the physicist, how can you make their life easier? Are there things you can do that everybody else won't? There are, and I would say some of those things might be, they find it kind of annoying when we go in and do a PM and then they come right back and they do a failed inspection. We have to create a work order or through, work through the whole process. What about if you find out how they're tracking, what their work orders are, being able to give them access to, if they're an employee of the hospital, to your CMMS, maybe incorporating physicist inspections into your yearly uh, programs, tying those dates to the pretty similar time frame of the PMs or at least the same month and maybe you have your staff and the physicist going in back to back. I go today, bam, physicist comes tomorrow or I go this morning, physicist goes this evening and you block them together and now that's a win for them. You ain't going to get pushback. You solve something that they probably get annoyed with because they don't understand us, we don't quite understand them, pretty complex. I think it's a good win. Important. Really, and, and again, the value from our perspective, I think, is if you go through the exercise and you get each one of these people, even if they don't acknowledge it at the time, but you understand what the motivators are and go through that, it only enhances your program and the ability to be successful. So uh, let's talk about it. Now, again, as we talked earlier, we talked about resources, right? So you have to figure out how to resources. And as you go through that, you know, um, is it going to be an internal resource or an external? And you have to figure out, I mean, as you're going through the history and looking at the equipment, you start to figure out how much time is it going to take, what's the commitment, corrective maintenance, preventive maintenance, and, and the ongoing rounding of the customer. Because let's be clear, when you take something over, just like anything else, people are going to see problems that don't necessarily exist for what they used to mask over, because all of a sudden it's a change, and change makes people uncomfortable. So you have to exceed expectations, right? Promise low, deliver high. Can't say that or not. So this is some things you consider, right? Um, <coughs> internal, external, what kind of training, how you go about getting them, making sure you have the right tools. Right? And some of the, I, I can't speak for anyone. I don't know what your all skills are, but you know, we don't want to buy the wrong tools for MRI. 
get the fungus injuries. Um, you know, the fans, manual software fees, remote diagnostic, you know, I mean, even as an in-house, you can outsource a remote diagnostic tool and make yourselves look tremendous in that. It's not that expensive. It just enhances your program. How many people would like remote diagnostics? For those of you that were engineers or are, like myself, boy, I wish that was something I had, you know, 20 years ago, remote diagnostics. Not having to always go in or being able to dial in remotely, being able to see system parameters. That's huge. There are options in today's world. Like I said, if you find value, find out who will sell it to you. Maybe the conversation is back with the OEM and saying, I want software keys. I want remote diagnostics. I want, you know, manuals. I want whatever. Tech support. Click labs. Okay, there's a value. What is that? Then find out, is it the same value the rest of the marketplace is on that? So go to an ISO that has an RDE package. Find out what the cost is. It gives you another point of data to compare. So these are all great conversations, and like Dave said, it's kind of new. But for the last at least three, four years, we're starting to see more and more advancement in RDUs outside of even OEMs. And I, I was standing on the floor mm -hmm. yesterday, and some gentleman came up to me, and he started, so he does. But, uh, so he came up to me and wants to sell me an RDU as individual sites. And it was actually pretty inexpensive. I'm trying to figure out how it works, but he says it's because it's in buying. But you know, that's all he does, he just sells an RDU. So it's out there. There's absolutely ways to do it. So in this case, this is where, to me, I think it's really important. Well, so once you've made the decision, you've gone everybody over, you've got, most likely, this is referred to an internal resource. It's imperative that you get these people what they need. The last thing you want to do is win that business over and not be able to support them. So it's really around putting together the plan, right? So is it an, R is it an RSTI? Is it going to send them back to the manufacturer? Uh, do we want somebody in the business that can train them on the job? You know, it's part of the transition strategy that you continue with the contract with the idea that for the first year that you're the person has to be standing alongside them and participate in the PM process. I mean, there's 105 things, and by the way, every one of them should be done. One of them will never be the other one. No, and there's a lot of options even here. And so I would just say, you know, there are places you can get training, even if you can't get training directly. There are a lot of ISOs that are doing some pretty wonderful training uh, today. I mean, I've seen a lot of the ones that are doing it. They're also offering tech support, too, a lot of places. You know, the other piece that I would say that goes right along with this piece, and it's sort of a training opportunity, is understanding what you're going to buy and where you're going to buy it from before it fails. And I always tell people, make sure you have some kind of plan that tells you where you're going to buy those parts from. Who have you qualified as a vendor or an ISO or an OEM? Do you have a primary, secondary, and tertiary? It's that way you know where to go. The worst time to shop for a part is when you need a part. Qualify, look at the market, see who's got what, have those conversations, get a couple price points before you even start because you'll know who to go to when it fails. Them aside. Oh, I think you're leaning nice. So just keep going. So that's yeah. that's what you're doing. That was perfect, Dave. I know. I know. And, and I know. so I would say up there, along with that, on hard. looking at you know whether it's ISOs, OEMs, once again, or yourself. I mean, I don't know too many people who want to have their own board stocking locations within the biomed department. I always tried to get rid of as much as that because I didn't want the overhead cost, and I don't want to you know have a million dollars in inventory sitting on the shelf because people get squirrely uh, with that. But <clears throat> You know, once again, as part of that qualification process and knowing where you're going to buy it before you buy it, will somebody put parts near you? Or is the closest venue, um, let's say, Atlanta, Atlanta, right? But now you have what? An operation where? Right here. Does that make a different buying decision if you're on the West Coast? I would say it might. Getting a part from here to California hour, hour and a half, not big deal. If it's from Georgia, big difference, and you're on the West Coast. So make sure you understand where the stuff's coming from, along with the qualification piece of what do you have, what's kind of the market pricing, give them a couple different, you know, I used to pick out kind of my top favorite 10. 
items that I've spent in the past, and I know our high value items that I have exposure on. Tell me what kind of the price is today. Pricing's always going to vary, but at least you'll have some benchmarks and you'll know what can I get, how quickly can I get it, and what's the best. These are hero kits. I mean, there are times where you just can't narrow it down any further. Even as good as the advanced diagnostics and everything are getting on equipment, there is time where you can't narrow it down further. And you do need three or four boards. And you do need a hero kit. Okay? Once again, qualification question. Do you offer anything like that? And then, of course, with that one, my also favorite question is, what's the restocking fee? So that hero kit comes out, I need one out of the five boards, do I pay 20% on the other four? So in, in essence, I've almost paid twice. Or is it one where I use what I use and there's no restocking fee? Followed by an advance. Leverage is up front. Negotiate that. Mm -hmm. Quality, DOAs, ask for that information. Everybody's tracking it. Not only the manufacturers, ISOs are also very closely tracking this. And this is a differentiator. Ask them for that data around their DOAs. They'll be happy to provide it. It gives you a point of clarification. These are not mutually exclusive, in my mind. You have to have all of this. Because at the end of the day, one of the things that's going to happen, more my words, is you're going to get to a point where you can't fix something. It's just going to happen. It happens every day. So you have to have in your back pocket a partner that you know that you can count on. It's going to give you the parts that you have. They're going to train to make sure you're there. Possibly be the person that you can pick up the phone and give you their eyes and arms. That you have is a nice resource that's going to be there. You've got to know that you have to support you. They'll come in and do it or whatever the situation is, and hopefully you got somebody to provide you an idea so you're pro proactively preventing. But you need all that in addition to. And if you don't work it out in front, to Tim's point earlier, and try to do it when you're in the thick of it, probably not going to look good in front of me if you just run over to get some papers. And sometimes there's strategic advantages to having them together in the same place. Being somebody who spent more than half my life in the education side of the business, I used to commonly receive you know, lots of phone calls for my students around the pieces. There's an advantage to somebody who teaches you and then acts as a support mechanism and has the ability to remotely dial in. Now you're talking some economies of scale, some leverage. Because most people on the education side do want to help. And they will pick up that call on their phone. It used to be quite common, most instructors would have their cell phone numbers, give out cards for their information. They want people to call them. Same thing today. One of the things that I think and I can comfortably say, I guess it's interesting to see how Tim responds to this, is likely, unless there's a crisis in organization and there's just something that has to happen, likely this isn't something that you're going to go from not doing it today to doing it tomorrow. It's a transition. And a lot of us that have done this in our world, we start out with, let's say, ultrasound, sea arms, right, corticals, or even RMF, before we really start working with some of those stuff. So it's a transition. And it comes at, you know, it's, it's a growing plan. It's, it's winning over the confidence of the radiology department and administration as you take it in incremental steps. So the things to consider and that we're trying to, you know, illustrate here is what does that look like, right? So maybe you just start out with a PM only contract so that the vendor that you choose is responsible to make sure the device is working right. And you're tagging along all the time. You know, maybe you got just a corrective maintenance. And by the way, this could be different for each piece of equipment. It might be that you got two. CTs. One of them you want PM only and the other one CMY. It's all varied. What works for you and the resource? Remember we talked about resources? What is it your resource has and skill set and talent? How's it going to match up to what you're doing? Remote diagnostic is a separate thing that you could add on. So, you know, when you have to pitch once. You know, you got independent service organizations that you can rely on, right? And, and, and work for that. One thing that I'll tell you is that I, I actually used to run a company called Fisher Consulting. I don't know if any of you ever remember that way back when. But it's an insurance product. Is anybody familiar with what an insurance product looks like? So, not many, right? That It's really a great opportunity, right? And as a matter of fact, we happen to have an expert in the back of the room back here, Tom. Um, but in fact, it, it's a guaranteed cap. It's usually somewhere around 10 to 20% savings. And you have the insurance that at any time something goes wrong, you can pick up the phone and call it and they pay the bill. So, it's a great transition strategy. It gives you some sort of a security cushion, if you will. And it kind of leans to Dave's you know, point. That is one that kind of lends itself to the fact of making that shift. 
moving them and making them a little more comfortable that you're now in charge of it. It's under the program. It's covered. They're not going to have wild expenditures, but you can call. You can get the service. Now you're having all the information, all the data, everything that goes along with it. And then that's, once again, a building block. That's giving you the foundation, the information. It gets the end user away from calling the OEM directly. It's going all through you because it's PO based and driven. And now you have some control. It gives you kind of that information to have that next discussion around, okay, here's what we spent. I want to start doing more of the work. And I would say, once again, creativity around that. Insurance programs have changed quite a bit. Some of them even will allow you to perform your own services. Okay, that's just getting you one more foot in the door, one more step towards the right direction. Um, you know, I think it's one of those areas, especially if you have a conservative administration in your hospital or conservative financial department that doesn't want to see wild swings and fluctuations, that's a good way to mitigate some of that. I would say it's not the only way. It's one of the ones, even if you want to go full service and you want to do everything you want, maybe like I said before, you want the clinical labs, you want all the other pieces, but you're doing 100% of it by yourself. What does that financial model look like? Are you going to run that and do it the exact same way you do the biomed program or what you're currently doing in imaging? Or can you come up with an alternate strategy? Because at the end of the day, they don't want to see the $150,000 swing. So what can you do to entice them? Can you create your own financial model? Can you create your own pool that you can have to handle those large expenditures? Because one, you're not going to want to see it in the month that it happens. Two, I've never met anybody that can accurately predict when it will happen. Um, sort of like the light bulb, you turn it on, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Although that's even changing a little bit. If you look at some of the you know, two programs from Siemens, things like that, they're getting better with predictive analytics and things on that nature. But it's one where I would say, create your own model. Create an insurance or a self-insurance model and option. If you have multiple hospitals, how do you prevent anybody from receiving pain points? And so do you have a system pool with allocations? And so one of the ones I used to always discuss around what we did at Banner, we created a model that was very much around a self-insurance piece because we knew we were going to have tons of expenditures. We had 30 different radiology directors across the system. How do you keep 30 people continuously bought into a program? You have to incentivize them and make it to where everybody wins together or loses together. And so when you can create a self-insurance pool and an allocation base, and as long as you don't go over the pool, everybody pays their value and no more, you can have catastrophic failures. So out of 30 hospitals, I could have you know, four CT catastrophic failures a month and have half a million dollars in expenditures and wouldn't even bat an eyelash. Now, if you don't have the financial model right, what's going to happen is those five hospitals that had the catastrophic failure, they come back to you and they go, Tim, that was a wonderful idea. You saved our hospital system $2 million. <clears throat> but at my hospital, as the CEO, guess what you just did? I used to have a $100,000 contract, and you just cost me $200,000. Happy the hospital system saved money, but last time I checked, I have to run my hospital and make money. And then you start ending up with what I call people opting out. And so you had 30 people all engaged, they were all right along, and then all of a sudden, the catastrophic failure happens, and you have people go, wow, this wasn't a great deal for me. I'm glad 29 of my best friends in the hospital system all made money and did well. Your poor decision to cost me my job. Figure out that financial model, and that doesn't happen. Because it also enables you when you have changes in leadership, maybe a new radiology director that comes in, and they say, boy, I've been using GE the last 30 years. Um, wonderful you have this program, but I'm going to do something different. When everybody wins and loses together, now that one radiology director's got to sell why they're so different to their 29 other counterparts and how they're different and it's going to cost everybody else more money because they opted out, which drove the cost up. <clears throat> you don't even really have to defend that decision. The other 29 radiology directors will do it for you. And so there's 
like I said, the financial model has to be something you put a lot of thought around. You also want to look at some variations if you have multiple hospitals. You have critical access hospitals. They're reimbursed completely differently. They want to see all that expense because that's what determines what they get reimbursed and paid at the end of the day. So you got to think about that. What do I do for the critical access hospital? Do they fall into the same piece? Do they fall into a, you know, another way of looking at it? The financial modeling is the utmost of importance for the future success of a program. Like I said, catastrophic failures make people do very silly stuff. You have a $200,000 you know, CT repair, people go wild. And that's just what they did. You have to find a way to mitigate that to where it never happens. How do you absorb it? Whether it's pools, insurance, self-insurance, creative financial models, like when I described that banner that I created, you've got to find a way to put that model in place to protect everybody <laughs> and to keep them your allies. Yes. And boy, doesn't that look good? Who doesn't like getting money back at the end of the year? Yeah, but you made some instant friends. The biggest risk with it, honestly, is people start getting to the point where they don't even want to do some service and some things because they've seen this. We're getting close to the end of the year, and I know I might get some money back if I don't do this. That's not the position you want to be in, but it's a different position to be in than what we're in today. So, congratulations, all. You, you, you've done it. You brought it in house. You're managing it. So, here's some things to make sure you keep it. As Tim was just talking about, um, you know, how the challenges are there, and people want to opt out because they see it differently. So, I guess the most important thing here is, is you know, some, some tidbits and things to think about, right? First of all, you can't hold a community. I don't I didn't want to type it anymore, but there's my whole page community. Please communicate. You gotta tell people what's going on. They've just gone through a big change. They lost some responsibility, some control, some accountability, and they've given that to you. So you have to give them a complete assurance on a regular basis that you're managing it as good or better than was being done before. You know, and so this is just what I what we came up with, I came up with from a perspective of wanting to make sure that the service call is managed right, right? So I, I just think these are just good things to do, right? Now is that you receive the call. Hey. I, I got it. I know that you're down. I, I, I'm letting you know that I know that. Take care of it. Tell them when you're going to show up. Show up when you said you're going to show up. If you can't make it, make sure you call them and tell them that you can't make it. And when you will be. Right? Inform the staff what you plan to do. You know, I understood you tell me this was the issue. Here's what I'm planning on doing to try to mitigate that. Well, by the way, are you having any other problems that I, that I don't know about as you've been acting a little strange? So I can take care of that at the same time. Around, you know, keep them updated as to what's going on. I mean, if you get in either 20 minutes, half an hour, well, that's fine. But if you're going to be a few hours, half a day, a few days, make sure you tell them continuously what you're doing to continuously update that. Make it so you can get back online as soon as possible. Or when, it's, when it should be device should be operational, you know, make sure you tell them what you did. If you can, if there's something that they did that they can, you know, try to make sure that it doesn't happen again. All these things are common sense, but I want to throw it out there. And we do we get channels on a regular basis. In my mind, I'm just going to be honest. Imaging folks in particular are not the greatest documenters. Let's put it out there. Blast me. Yeah, with the exception of Tim. But everything about Tim is better than the average Joe anyways. Yes, sir. Yeah, something like my fifth very dumb right Right. Yes, that's what I was going to say. You need to inform multiple layers. You, you must get some of the same phone calls I get. Did you ever have the uh, what I call the mystical ninjas of imaging service? The ones that are so good they fix it, but yet nobody else knew it was fixed when they left. Those, and you gotta love them because some of them are just really that great. And, and but the communication piece, telling multiple people, you know, often a lot of our repairs and work and imaging is done at night. And you would think there would be this wonderful transition between third shift technologists and the first shift coming in in the morning. They would communicate, tell everybody what happens. All the first shift or second shift person knew is it broken when I left. Nobody's told me anything. There's not any notes on the thing. I would assume it's still probably broken. Now, they get called to do 30 other things. They don't even go check. Then you get a call at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Hey, is anybody going to ever show up and fix it? fixed like two o'clock in the morning things. Um, 
you know, there's a lot to be set up here, and, and communication is very important. But I would also say it's the way or the method of the communication. What I mean by that is, is it a phone call? Is it an email? Text, as much as I don't like to say it. Um, not a text person, not an app person. I don't like any of them. But a lot of people are today communicating via text, which is fine. That's just an alternate way of communicating. That's what I know to respond to. I don't. And everybody will tell you the same thing. If you send me a text, I probably, I look at my phone for text maybe once a day. It's just not how I communicate. I'm always calling from it. But the piece I would say is alter that mechanism of communication too. If the first time you get a response or get a ticket and you make a phone call, maybe you follow up with an email, you get another phone call, go meet them face to face. There is so much value in that face to face communication. It's huge. Things you can do that you can over the phone. The body language you can see from the customer when you're explaining to them, hey, by the way, this is going to take two days. I'm waiting parts. Here's what's going on. Is that a phone call discussion, an email discussion, or an in-person face-to-face discussion? <clears throat> Most people in our world, in the technology side, would rather it be a phone call or an email. We're not always wanting to go out and see everybody and talk. But I would challenge your staff. You know, one of the ones I put in place many years ago is called a three-step communication process. If you talk to the same person three times, one of them has to be in person. Doesn't matter. It could be on three separate pieces of equipment. If Linda from the OR calls you three times, you are a visit in person. And we should actually document it and track it. Boy, customer satisfaction went up through the roof in that organization. What do we do? We were always communicating, I think, and we were communicating pretty well. We just changed the vehicle of communication. When you show up, people immediately understand how important you feel it is. Anybody can pick up a phone. Quite frankly, they call, you know, text support, or they call the OEM. They pick up a phone, too. The benefit of you being in-house and being on-site, you can do what they can. You can go get that response and go actually talk to them. Huge value. Huge value. Not done near enough. Face-to-face -face communication. To follow that up, a lot of the things that put us here. So one of the things that we try to work with technicians on is if the only time you go upstairs is when there's a problem, and when you walk in the department, that's an odd shit moment. Because they just think there must be a problem. That's the only time mm -hmm. you see this person. So my suggestion on a regular basis is after you fixed it, why like people are still in a good mood within a day or two or three afterwards, go back up and just say, hey, how is it going? Did you like what I did? I'm hearing a positive note. It really does get you a lot of weight. Yes. Frustrated. <laughs> yeah. Or if they're frustrated in advance when you're walking through parking days, everything worked great. Or you ever go do a PM and you actually find stuff broken on the PM and you're like, wow, I wish they would have just called. And, and rounding is a great way to do that. And it's looking through the thing and then using it as an ed education moment and going back to the radiology director, or maybe CT supervisor, and going, hey, by the way, I was up here rounding, and here's something I found. Not hugely important today, but if we don't do something now, this is going to turn into probably a day, two days worth of downtime for you when I have to replace you know, the control board on the console because it had you know, been cleaned with bleach for nine months nobody knew it was disintegrating the overlay on the keyboard could take me a couple minutes if you were rounding and you were talking to them but like i said use it as an educational opportunity as well i'm saying look this could have been a catastrophic done this would have caused you two days worth of downtime and people got to report when you see these things even if everything else is working wonderfully i'm not going to come up and fix it right that minute I'll talk with you about it. Maybe I'll come in after hours and do it. Or maybe I'll come in before you start in the morning and do it. Immediately, customers always think the minute they place a phone call, that's when it's got to be fixed. Change their mindset. Talk to them about that and say, even if it's something minor, let us know. We can schedule it and schedule around that for you. <laughs> Full education opportunity.
I, I would just uh, add to your, my, my addition to your list would be empathy. Empathy with uh, the customer. Let them know that uh, you're, you, you understand the effect of that room being down, if that's going to be their schedule. Especially, God forbid, if you worked on it and didn't get it quite right, and now you've got to come back. Yeah. I mean that's a yeah. uh, that's a, that's a service recovery there. That's a that's a, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I would say even if you're one, this is one people think I tell my text all the time. Even if you're not at fault, just say you're at fault. Eat a small piece of humble pie. Say you know what that was my mistake. I'm sorry. And if it was their fault because of an education, take that as an opportunity. You know what that's my fault. I should have showed you how to do that earlier. Even if it's not, that little piece of humble pie is going to be so much easier to swallow. And damn radio out director breathing down yours or your boss's throat because you were trying to be obstinate and prove something wrong. You will not, you may win that battle, you will lose the war. Guaranteed. If you're regretting the conversation, you're not happy. Mm-hmm. You're not happy. Mm-hmm. You're not happy. Mm-hmm. You're not and by the way, me and Dave do update these just as we did the one yesterday. Yeah, yeah. We're going to so, add in those suggestions. That's quite yep. frankly one of the benefits of having the collective yeah, knowledge right. of any, everybody in this audience. I'll update from those two comments as well as yesterday. We were able to update so that when you go to the web later, um, you'll be able to get the changes. Yeah. 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 Everybody's heard the old ad, right? So an extroverted engineer is the guy that looks at your shoes rather than their own shoes when I'm talking. I would just say this. For, how many people know Manny Roman? Right? I mean, I've known Manny. You know, this is old as I'm long as I'm old. But you know what? The guy does some great communication stuff. He does some wonderful presentations around. And he'll actually come to your hospital and do a presentation for a day or half a day or two days. And it, it, it's, I can't, I mean, it talks about you know, how to communicate with somebody and, you know, that's in a really bad mode, and, you know, and they're really pissed off. And, you know, it's talking about how you face them versus not facing them, how you let them list and drain. And, I mean, it's two days worth of stuff, but it's phenomenal the value that you and your text will get out of it. So. I would second that if you ever have a chance to attend uh, any of them. Sometimes he does it at Andy Expo. I think he's done a couple at Amy over the years. Um, doing this. Yeah. I would say anytime you have a chance, that's somebody who I consider kind of legendary in this business. He is the first per- per- person that I learned about imaging from back in Dye Tech you know, 24 years ago when I first sat down in the classroom. I'm like, who is this guy? I mean, this, and by 24 years ago, he was kind of running around going crazy, but the guy is a genius. He knows stuff I will never probably dream of understanding. So anytime I have a chance to sit in something he does, sit around, play a hand of poker with the guy, just an awesome guy. Can't say more about it. And again, I wouldn't be, you know, passionate about this career field in imaging if I hadn't sat down in one of his courses years ago in a Ditech phase one and heard the passion he had about the business, the things that he understood, and say, I'd love to know something. I'd love to be better at doing that. And he'll come. He'll, he'll come to your facility, or even another option. I mean, do you, hopefully, all you guys belong to some local biomed society, right? Wherever the state is that you he'll live come in. Come present. Right. Yeah. Have, them, have them come talk to your to your regional society. I mean, I'm telling you, the guy's great. This is just a kind of repeat slide. You can kind of move on. There's not a whole lot there. But this one here, um, I think Tim got a lot of passion around this one here. And, you know, Absolutely. And, and like I said, coming from the education side, and, and we got your name, gentlemen, right there. You had mentioned before about empowering your employees yeah. and training them. There is not a single thing you can do that's more important as a director than empowering your employees. That means getting the training, making sure they have the tools and test equipment that they need to do their job effectively. If they have communication challenges, what have you done to work with them to empower them to be better? Did you sign them up for a hundred dollar you know webinar around effective communications? Or maybe they were an aspiring leader and you sent them to a class around conflict resolution. Heck, that's a great one for just even imaging engineers. But empowering your staff will win the battle every single day. Where people fail is when we convert programs or do things, and we don't give people the basic resources that they need to be successful. Imaging is very complex, very difficult. If you're not 100% well-versed in it, 
one of the great places to learn or to ask is if you're an imaging engineer. Ask them what they need. Ask them if they have the tools to do their job. It's actually one during every one of my one-on-one -on -one discussions with my direct reports in my organization. It's one of the first questions I always ask when we start off a conference call or we start off a thing. Do you have everything you need to do your job effectively? Is there anything you're missing or do you need support in any way you're not currently receiving? Start asking that question all the time. The first couple times you ask it, you'll probably get, yeah, no, I'm good. The more and more you keep asking, the more and more comfortable people go, oh, yeah, but you know, I had a conversation with somebody the other day. They do a lot of data analytics for our company, tons of data analytics. And I started off the conversation with this. Now, I've been asking this question about four months, probably, of this individual. And one of the ones that came back the other day, and he goes, man, he goes, sometimes when I open these spreadsheets, you know, that have 150,000 line items in Excel, and I want to make changes, it takes forever. Is that something you can address? He had a laptop computer. We all know laptops are not nearly as fast as desktops. Could you do something different for that individual? Yeah, we went out and got him a uh, graphical performance PC that graphical designers use. Turned around his processing time 80% faster. Been doing it that way for years. It's a simple question. You have the tools and resources and everything you need to do your job effectively. Is there something that would help you? That was help. It cost me 1400 bucks for an 80% improvement in performance on something he does every single day. That's a win. That's empowering staff. You know what you also get with that that's wonderful? Engagement. When you empower people, happy, productive, and they're more likely to stay with you. Know your numbers. Can't say it enough. Um, it's one of the things consultants, OEMs, myself, if I come in to sell something into your organization, something I'm going to know very well. You got to know it equally as well. The numbers. You got to be able to predict them. You got to be able to stand behind them, and you got to have all those other mechanisms in place that make it successful. Whether it's allocation models, creative financial things. Know the numbers, know how it impacts everybody in the organization. Infrastructure program design, like I said before, kind of goes back to that empowerment of the staff. What's the program look like? What infrastructure are you going to have in place? Do you have a call center? Great one on the imaging side. After hours may go to a pager or something like that in your organization, an on-call cell phone, but imaging may be a little different. You have the infrastructure to support that. Is it something you just have to go out and buy? There are call center companies who will do it for you. They're not very expensive. It's, you know, a buck, two bucks, three bucks a call, something like that. Did you look at that as an option? It might be an option to consider for an infrastructure and design. Uh, operating a company model. This is what I look at when I look at health systems. One of the most complex parts is every health system is very different. I've never seen two alike ever. And I boil them down into two different models. One, I consider an operating company. And as my former CEO at a health system used to say, we have one hospital, we just have 30 locations. That is a much different model than what you find in some of the other large healthcare systems, which I call holding companies. They hold 30, 40, 50 hospitals, they all operate independently and make their own decisions. That's going to drastically affect how you propose or sell something <laughs> inside those environments. Big factors to consider. Capitalizing on purchase, we talked about this throughout the uh, whole presentation, but your leverage is up front before you ever do anything. Also, when you're purchasing, make sure you consider those things, such as you know, 30 day outs for no penalties, training, whether you have to pay for it or not, I guarantee it's going to benefit you in the long term. Um, looking at you know uh, discounts. Why would you purchase a piece of equipment would you only ask for the discount on the piece of equipment? At the same time, don't you want to also guarantee a discount in parts? Labor rates that are maybe not 
I don't know, what's a good labor rate today? About four hundred dollars an hour, three fifty, four hundred. May even be more than that. So, did you negotiate that up front, <laughs> or did you wait for the time when you actually needed the column and you went, "Holy oh, cow, it's five hundred fifty dollars an hour." What? Um, that's something to capitalize on that purchase and before you make that commitment. It's not saying you're going to use it, as I often say. If I, you know, negotiated a forty percent discount on parts, chances are. I'm not planning on buying the parts from them anyway. That's a worst case scenario. If everything else fails, and let's say MIS is my preferred provider for GMR, and let's say they just don't have the parts, they shipped out for that same day, that would be there. And I tried three other places to keep find the parts I have. Maybe it's an RFM, something pretty expensive. Do you want to be put in a position where now that RF amps, you know, $180,000, or at the worst case scenario, you already negotiated part of that uh, purchase, a 40% discount on supplies? Well, you know what? It's not ideal. It's still going to cost you 100 grand, but is it better than 180? Or if the discount's so great, and maybe they're wanting to entice you to buy the parts directly from them, that's going to be something you want to consider. They might say, you know what? We'll raise it, you know, and these are theoretical wild numbers. Please don't ever quote me on them. Um, but they might say it's a 60% discount. Well, then that may change some of my decisions on where I'm buying and how I'm buying it. And you really haven't put anything out of the team. You haven't done anything different than you were going to do in the first place. You're still going to buy the piece of equipment. You negotiated insurance for yourself. On the worst day of the worst days, you now have a solution. It might be your backup, it might be your tertiary, but you have a solution that's not going to kill you. Strategic planning, you know, looking at, you know, capital, how can you make a little bit more out of that? One piece I always say, in hospitals, capital is what is left over after you pay your bills and you run your operations. The more money you save in the operations, the more money that there's available for capital. It's also about being creative around capital and looking. Can you create a capital plan that has a push-pull effect? And so next year, I might need to buy two CTs and replace them. The following year, I have three. The year after that, I have another three. Well, can I combine them and push them all together now and have seven in the middle year or the first year or the third year, wherever that capital you know, funding looks like for your organization? And it's a push-pull. If you're trying to get economies of scale and aggregate volumes to negotiate even more of that other stuff up there that I said. So I think that's a great idea. Centralized contracting, purchasing, and servicing. Um, the supply chain could be our best friends in this business. They continuously deal with purchasing and contracting on a daily basis. Work with them. They have some expertise. They probably help us come up with the things too. I always invited them to every discussion I had on service. When I was in house, if I was sitting down with the vendor, they were sitting down. Why? There's a lot of leverage. You know, one of my favorite ones was, is I had uh, a manufacturer, and one of the first questions I used to ask them was, "How much do I spend with you a year?" What do you think they come back with? They're talking about me, how much I spend, not how much my total total organization spends. We're having a much different conversation. I might spend five million a year with them on service, but our organization probably spent eighty million a year. Bring the other seventy-five million with you to the table. There's value. You're having an eighty million dollar discussion instead of a five. That changes the way you're going to approach that negotiation. Yeah. 
but you and I all know the substance of the Buddhist, there's a tail end of that, that no one can get out of. Yeah, you would just, you, you start a conversation out with cyclical. These can't be cyclical because these are 10 and 15 year commitments. That's right. And they've bought your equipment and now you can't afford to get out of it. Cash is hard to come by. Cash is hard to come by. And if you get caught up in that cycle, that's all. If you have something very valuable to come to that conversation, it's not a piece of things. Just be aware of it and be communicating with this conversation. And a lot of that has occurred due to the way organizations now have to report what they're considering operational leases. And operational leases are now considered pretty much the same as a normal expenditure in an organization. You can't appreciate them over multiple expenditures, years, and things like that. So some of those rules and regulations have driven that to having much more complex solutions now where you're looking at, I'll buy everything. <laughs> what does that really mean? And what's the outcome at the end of the day? Could you ever do anything different once you make that? Quite frankly, unless your hospital just disappeared, you're not going to do anything I'm different. Not. Everything. Everything. Right. I mean, look, if you if you get if if you've got 500 fusion homes, just do the math here. So you've got 500 fusion homes, and they give you a, I don't know 50, 25 bucks a piece for them, and you think, oh that's great, I got some money to go buy some stuff. Ten years later, you decide, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. Why do you go buy those 500 fusion homes at 3,500 dollars a piece? I mean, I'm just if you're if you've got over CTs and MRIs, you can't, you'll never get out of it. You are stuck with that forever. Nobody in this room ever gets to make that decision, but I'm just telling you, it's coming. I, I, we're gonna, we've been keeping you guys a long time. I, I and I'm just, just saying, it's around understanding all those variables. And like I said, nobody out there is your enemy, including the OEM. Make them your friends. Make them understand what's important to you, what you're willing to pay for, and what you're willing to buy. And then work those solutions they're very much the same UI as everybody. I don't think I was a different human being when I worked for the OEM. I don't think I'm a different human being today. I'm still the same kind of approachable person I was old, uh, even back then. You just have to have the conversation and you have to be willing to articulate what the value is to you and explain to them because nobody's a mind reader and they can't guess what's important for you. And often I hear people say, well, give us a solution give you any solution you want. Is it something you believe in, you believe there's value in, and is important to you? Well, if you don't tell me what those things are, I can't create any solution for it. The last slide is just, I'm a guy that put pictures. Pictures of what do it for me. So this is a picture as far as I'm concerned. Right? It's, you have all the support today, you want to do it all yourself. So how do you transition from here to there? It's all it's just something to keep in the back of your head. All the stuff that we talked about is scratching the surface around all the things that you're going to have to figure out how to go do in your facility the way your facility does it in the culture of your organization to get from here to there. And it, it, I, I, just, I couldn't give you a prescription because every, to Tim's point earlier, every facility is going to do it differently. But in the backbone, it's, it's kind of all similar and you just need to work it out for you specifically. Any other questions for you, Tim or I? And I would just add one other point. Don't think you have to do it all yourself. People will help you if you reach out and ask the right questions. There's not very many people I meet in this group that won't help you. Sometimes, though, we think we always have to have the answer ourselves. And I'll tell you, when I had the banner program and grew it from you know, on the imaging side, you know, half you know, a dozen engineers plus to over 60 some odd, I probably talked to 50 people almost on a continuous basis, getting ideas, thoughts, things like that. It wasn't something I created just up here. It was a collective knowledge of a lot of people like yourself, others in this career group, probably I've talked to Dave several times, Manny, other people, just to get different perspectives. It's not something you have to solve on your own. You have a question for me? Link in me. Now, I don't check that as much as text, which is even worse, but I have my phone number available all the time. If you call, 
chances are you probably get a call back within 24 hours because one thing I do is I always answer the phone. So I would just say, shoot me a LinkedIn one, maybe shoot me a second reminder and just say, hey, can you call me? I can have to lend you anything I know. There's nothing I've created that's sacred to me or that I wouldn't share. Some of them may be great ideas, some of them may just go to Tim, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard, and I'd say, great, don't use it. Use the ones you like. Use what you like. Don't use what you don't. So, questions? It's absolutely, yeah. it's absolutely true. It, to your point, I, I look at that, I call it service delivery strategy. Every device has to have its own unique service delivery strategy, but you can have an aggregate, and we're only talking about imaging here, but you can have an aggregate, but to your point, just like your kids, every one of them got to be treated just a little bit different, right? Yep, that's exactly mm -hmm. right. That's exactly right. I got the advantage. Making the best decision. Yep. But that's where we talked earlier, right? Like understanding the history, right? Looking at that individual one as well as reaching out, as Tim just said, reaching out in the industry to find out. Just because you either got a really bad one or a really good one, how does that reflect the rest of the industry for that device and that modality? <laughs> similar like conditions, right? Because, you know, we all know it's a rural hospital in the middle of nowhere versus a teaching institution. Yeah. It's from totally different things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, again, really appreciate your time. Hopefully, you took away something. And uh, let's give you something to check out the vendors. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you.